Good morning. morning. Welcome. Welcome on this beautiful sunny day to worship at St. Andrew's United Church. It's indeed an honor and a pleasure to gather each and every Sunday as we worship God, Christ, and Holy Spirit. I have a, a number to throw out there, and I'm wondering if anybody can share with me the significance of this number, okay? 1,041. And, well, yeah, that would, that would be one more, yeah? 1,041. Well, if you multiply 52, times 20, you get 1,040. If you add 1, you get 1,041. And this Sunday marks the 1,041st Sunday of Greg Walshaw being the music director at St. Andrews United Church. Now, in the NHL, if you play a 1,000 games, you get a silver or a platinum hockey stick. Um, at St. Andrews, you get your first choice of cupcake <laughs> after the service. Uh, we shared some words last week about uh, Greg's dedication uh, during his tenure here at St. Andrews, not only in his uh, continued growth as, uh, as a, uh, an organist, a musician, uh, but also uh, his continued uh, excellence in producing uh, both in music and in lyric, uh, fantastic, fantastic expressions of faith. And uh, so we celebrate uh, for two weeks straight now, Greg, um, your, your mastery and your giftedness that you have shared with St. Andrews. And uh, as a continuation of Greg's ministry here, uh, there will be a continuation of the free monthly recitals continuing this month. Uh, next Saturday, February 18th, please join Greg for an afternoon of music you might not expect to hear from the organ. Now last week we joked whether it was going to be a little Guns N' Roses on the organ, and um, I don't think that that's going to happen, but I'm sure it'll be something else excellent that you will hear on the organ next week. Future dates include March the 18th with a, an artist to be announced, April 15th with trumpeter and good friend of St. Andrews, Ken Baldwin, and on the 27th of May, uh, Katie Walshaw and Sean Oakes will accompany with their beautiful voices, uh, Greg, on that special recited, recital day. Uh, it is with my distinct pleasure to welcome Hillary and Kate uh, to share a special presentation with us this morning. <laughs> Fans in the balcony. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, so this morning we would like to um, share some information. It'll also there will also be uh, some correspondence through email, and it'll be available, I think, for folks on Facebook. Um, but we wanted to provide. Uh, some context for one of the initiatives that we've uh, decided to undertake uh, as a board and I think largely as a congregation. So we want to give some, you, you'll see in your bulletin today there's a flyer uh, about the affirming church process. So we wanted to give you a little bit more context about what that means and what the vision is for St. Andrew. Within that, I did want to make reference, uh, if we look at our strategic mission and priorities, uh, engaging with families, children, and youth, actively participating in racial and social justice and advocating for those with disabilities uh, through Soup for the Soul and Margot's Place, sharing in meaningful worship and music, Thanks, Craig. <laughs> uh, supporting, supporting all gender identities and sexual orientations and providing compassionate pastoral care. This uh, specifically speaks to social justice and gender identities and sexual orientations. Did you want to read the first? Oh, no, sorry, Natalie. Can you go back? Thank you, honey. Okay, so the goal of the affirming process is a public intentional, explicit welcome 
for diverse gender identities and sexual orientations. We might think, and I, I think largely we are, a place that is welcoming and, and is uh, open to all, but it's really important in this process that we explicitly are intentional in how we go about that because sometimes what we think we're doing is not necessarily clear to the community. So we really want to be thoughtful and we want to meet everyone on their own journey because that's the other part of this process. As a congregation, we all come to this with our own experiences and our own understandings. And so it's really important that we start where we are and then we take this journey together. And I think we want to go a step beyond welcoming and into um, inviting and affirming, which is why it's called the Affirming Church Process. Yeah. Okay, so the steps to becoming an affirming church, uh, the process is spiritual, reflective, contextual, educational, and fully participatory. So everyone is involved. It takes <laughs> that too. It takes as long as it needs to. So there is no timeline specifically. Uh, it's about stories and struggles. It's about people, not paper. And ultimately, it's about transformation. Natalie? Thanks, hon. Oh, yeah. So the vi we couldn't get the video to work. There's a video. It'll come in your email. It's good. It's It'll give some context of another church that has been through this process and some of the members of that congregation sharing their stories. And, and it's um, from the perspective of people who have had this experience. Yeah, but it would be terrible without sound. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're not going to watch it right now. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. So, yes. We will try to get it working for perhaps next week, the video, but they're, they're just, the sound wasn't working at all today. Yeah, well. Okay. Yeah, so okay. In, in, did you get a bulletin? So this is the same kind of concept, it's just a video format of that. So this, if you look at what's in your, in your bulletin, that the add-in has the information on there as well. Okay? Okay. okay. So, maybe sure. So step one of the, of the affirming process is encountering the need. So a need, question, or vision leads a ministry to ask how it can be publicly, intentionally, and explicitly welcoming. Second step is discerning. A group forms to start looking at how to become more radically and intentionally welcoming. They consider the affirming process and get in touch with the affirming ministry coordinators. So we have done that, and um, and now we're looking at the third step. Embarking, the decision is formally uh, the decision to formally enter the affirming process is made by the ministry's governing body. So we've been to the board, and this is a, a process that we've decided to undertake. A working group is set up. <laughs> this is where you come in <laughs> so <clears throat> my email's up there at the end and or you can speak to me or hillary at the end of uh, the service or next week or whenever you get a moment but uh if you are interested in participating in this initiative and want to know more then we're the people to talk to yeah we're a fun group <laughs> um <laughs> engaging so uh we will be over the next several months uh educating storytelling praying hearing fears and hopes, working with all in the ministry and wider community to discern what being affirming could look like here at St. Andrews. And we're going to have a table set up in the church with educational materials as well. Uh, before a final decision is made, an inclusive marriage policy, vision statement, action plan for the future, and more must be created. So that's part of what the working group will do as after we you know, go through this process together. And then finally, we need to decide together 
Um, whether we're going to formally become affirming, that will involve a vote. And um, then we will celebrate our decision. And join the family, yes. The last, yeah. the last step is joining the affirming family. Natalie, can we? Thank you. Um, holding a public celebration. And uh, this is an organization that's like national within the United Church. So, so all of this process is formalized and we have guidance from those folks to help us out. So if you're interested in learning more, they have a website that has tons of information. Uh, if that is not uh, your mode of uh, information gathering, then we will have a table set up in, in the church that you can look at the books and materials and flyers and things. And if you want more information, then you can contact me or Hillary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kate and Hillary. As we gather this morning and in, as we gather each and every Sunday within this place of worship, we recognize that we reside on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. And it is always in the spirit of reconciliation and right relationships and working towards this reality that we come to gather and to worship the one that will empower us with grace and guide us towards right relationships with all. And so we come and we worship God. Please join with me in our responsive call to worship this morning. How blessed are we when we meditate on God's teachings. And when we desire God with powerful hearts. So let us praise God with attentive minds and eager spirits. For we are God's servants, who are praying and praying together. So let us worship God and praise God's holy name. I invite you to join in our opening hymn this morning, Creation Like a Prism Shines, and this is a Greg Walshaw original, and so let us sing and worship our Creator. Thank you. 
Please be seated. I invite you to join with me as we open our hearts, the very essence of who we are as individuals and as a community of faith in prayer this morning. Let us pray. God of all life and each life, you are the light of minds that seek to know you. You are the strength for those who seek to serve you. You reveal truth to those who search for you. And in worship, we pause in your presence, resting from our work and responsibilities, from our worries and distractions. We come to enjoy your presence and praise you for the gift of life in Christ and in creation. And so receive our prayers and praise this day. For we open our hearts in love and loyalty to you, O God, our all in all. God, who is all in all, you call us to choose life and walk in your ways, but we are tempted by shortcuts and easy solutions. You ask us to turn from anger and settle our differences but we cling to grievances and point fingers at each other. You ask us to be true to your word, but we prefer to keep everybody happy. Forgive us, O oh God, and give us courage to follow the paths that you set before all your people. For we offer this in Christ's name. Amen. And so may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Also with you. Let us share this greeting with our neighbors this morning. Time to call a halt to this.
Okay, folks. We know that we have a multitude of choices that we can make that are always spread upon the table before us. Some of those choices can bring life and blessings and other choices can lead to despair. But when we give the very best of ourselves to our Creator, we make a choice for life, a choice to bless others in God's holy name. And so trust that God will bless the choices we make today as we share not only the best of ourselves, but all that we can share with others through our offerings in faith. Let us pray. O gracious and generous God, we bring our gifts to you in thanksgiving. So bless them and surprise us by all the Holy Spirit can accomplish with them. And bless our lives too, so that our choices will always honor you and for the good news that has been shared with us. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And as we will remember that I've said over the last, uh, or at least a few weeks ago, uh, there's always a very gracious thanksgiving at the beginning of Paul's letters that he shares with the churches that he's been a part of, and then immediately following this thanksgiving and telling them how much he loves them and the good things that happened while he was there, he gets into the nitty-gritty of the problems that they face. And what he's heard is quite upsetting. And so continuing on, Paul is trying to get the church in Corinth to recognize the divisions, both very prominent and those that are subtle within their hearing. And so Paul writes, and so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as a spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh 
and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each, for we are God's servants, working together. You are God's fields, God's building. Herein is wisdom. Thanks be to God. For those of us that have had children, or any of you who are aware of the early stages of childhood, you'll probably relate to Paul's metaphor uh, quite well. In general, we know that infants rely on their parents for sustenance, whether it comes through uh, the nat natural way of breast milk or, or formula. When a baby's born, you don't make a reservation at the keg and order your infant child the largest, most expensive steak because you know it'll go to waste. They cannot handle physically what is being placed in front of them. They can't chew. They don't have any teeth. They wouldn't enjoy it. They'd probably just pick it up and throw it. But yet, as a child grows, opportunities arise and the situation changes. Water and other liquids are added to the diet, mushy foods and other soft foods, and then gradually solids. And we know that this can take, you know, varying amounts of time as children grow up until they are willing or maybe unwilling to engage in a full array of foods. But this is a natural process, as well as taking time. We know that it can be messy. How many of us had 
clean clothes when feeding an infant. Not for long. Well, this is a good analogy that Paul uses for the growth of the spiritual life, and it's quite a deliberate one. Paul's entering into a conversation about where knowledge and where knowing and what experience and what maturity in faith might look like in a community. Because in Paul's time, the place of great teachers and philosophers was highly significant. Of course, today, if we want to know something, we take out a device, Google, maybe even voice, and all of a sudden the answer comes right to us. If we have a big question about quantum physics, shared in layperson terms, we can read that. If we want to know how to tie the perfect knot, we can look that up and it will come in a matter of seconds. It's a do-it-yourself, absolutely. If we're having problems with a math equation, it's not too hard to find the answer. Absolutely. We can call to mind greats like Einstein, or we can just punch the equation in and it will be done for us. The process of learning and of growing has changed so remarkably, but in Paul's day, the answers to the questions, the dialogue, it took years and years and years. And so it was the great teachers. And people would align themselves with those great teachers, say, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos. But Paul challenges this behavior as divisive and destructive of the community, and he appeals to a different understanding of where this knowledge that they seek about community, not only with one another, but the growing continuity of their lives with God and growth comes from. For Paul says they come to us not from the wisdom of teachers, they do not come from Googling it or reading in a book. But the knowledge of the divine comes solely from the divine. I planted, Paul says, Apollos watered. But it is God that offers growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. Well, this teaching took place in the context of a community of people who were going through a remarkable transformation. A transformation that was not always easy to walk. There wasn't a checklist or a set of directions to guide them. But it would, in fact, take patience and communication and connecting to who and what they were called as God people to journey. And this can be a messy business, times of transition and change. As messy as introducing new foods to infants. I can recall feeding my own children pureed fruit or vegetables, encouraging them to take the spoon in their hand for the first time. And what was the result? It didn't get thrown back at me, but there was food up their nose, there was food in their ears, there were food in their hair, there was food on the walls, there was food absolutely everywhere. That's why we have pressure washers. That's why we have pressure washers, yes. <laughs> but if we think of this as a metaphor for faith, faith is messy. It's messy until we practice it over and over and over and over again, and lo and behold, less food is spilt 
on the hair, on the walls, and it goes more directly into nourishing the body and the soul. And then we move on to the next years. Once the spoon has been mastered, you put a plate of Brussels sprouts in front of it. I can't tell you how many times I fell asleep at the table because I was not allowed to leave until I ate my Brussels sprouts. And in getting tired of sitting at the table night after night with these Brussels sprouts in front of me, you find a new way to consume those Brussels sprouts. First you try ketchup, and that did not go well. <laughs> then you might try mustard, that did not go well. There were times I fed them to the dog, yes, but of course that did not go well. Until I discovered that you would put a whole bunch of Brussels sprouts in your mouth and you would chew them as fast as you could, hold your nose and wash them down with a glass of milk. Did it taste good? No. Did it get the job done? Yes. And it isn't it amazing that over time you could feed me Brussels sprouts every day and they become something that is enjoyed and loved. You know, transitioning from one point or another whether it is in our tastes or whether, or whether it comes from our transitioning as a community of faith. It takes patience, it takes practice. And just to simply push the things that we don't like aside are not necessarily the best way forward. I recall a story from uh, one of my favorite preachers of all time, a fellow by the name of Tom Long. And uh, Tom tells this story about uh, a young man who can't understand why his father still goes to church. And so one day he confronts his father. And he says to his father, why do you persist in going to church every Sunday? You do not believe in God. Your life from Monday through Saturday in no way reflects anything to do with the good news. Why do you go to church? Because I know other people that go to church like Silverman's dad. Silverman goes and Silverman volunteers. And Silverman gives, and Silverman is a part of everything, but you do nothing. To which the father responds, I go to see Silverman. That's the only reason I go. Because that's where I get to see my friend. The point is worth remembering. The discipline of living together as a community of faith is something that takes patience, it takes time, and an understanding that we all come for different reasons. Some say it's not important to be here every Sunday. It's not important to be nourished in the ways of faith. It's not important to share in fellowship and encouragement of others. But is it? The spiritual diet, the delights 
of community are worth coming together and sharing. Amen. Let us pray. God of life and love, in spoken words and in our silence of our hearts, we give you thanks for all of life, for the grace you provide to creation and its diversity, and for your loving kindness known in the details of our lives. For, O oh God, where the church is divided by squabbling or deep disagreement, where Christians emphasize our differences instead of seeking unity, where we put energy into guarding our tradition or our way of doing things at the expense of honoring new life and relationships with our neighbors. We ask that you help us transform who we are to make all things new. Where families are divided by old hurts or new tensions, where friendships have ended through misunderstanding or neglect, where relationships have been severed by betrayal or thoughtlessness. We ask that you transform us and make all things new. Where countries are torn by war and conflict, where communities are divided by prejudice or unexamined privilege, where leaders provoke anger instead of building understanding and cooperation, we ask that you transform us and make all things new where the poor and lonely find little support or comfort, where people are tired from overwork or pressured by rising costs, where workers fear for their jobs in the present or in the future, help to transform us to make things new. Where people suffer pain with physical, emotional, or spiritual roots, where loss marks the beginning and ending of every day, where young people fear for the future of the planet and their elders mourn the loss of what they once assumed would last. Transform us and make things new. Within our hearts, O oh God, we mourn for tragedy that has struck families, and people and communities both near and far. We offer our prayers for all those who know the devastation of the loss of young children in an awful accident in Laval this past week. Yet we also have upon our hearts and our minds and our thoughts all those affected in Syria and Turkey for the tens of thousands who have lost their lives. And we give thanks for the passion and the commitment of those who have saved those who were surely thought to have perished. God, our source of love and grace, you do make all things new. And so united in one voice, we pray the words taught to us as our divine creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Our hymn of going forth this morning, number 506 from Voices United, Take My Life and Let It Be, number 506. So go this day with joy and peace to claim new life as you serve God and one another. And may the blessing of God who is the source, may the love of Jesus Christ, and may the empowering spirit of life be with you and those in the lives that you touch this day and every day. Amen. Bless with me.